uh, I, I gave you two kind of sets of, of, of questions. Um, did you guys get a chance to think about those questions over the week? I want to go to the first of the sets of questions. And just so you know, I'm not picking on you. At the end of the lesson, I will give my answers to these questions, too. So I'm not picking on you guys, okay? Um, so, uh, what difference exists between denominations, and does it matter? From, we all believe in something, right? <laughs> um, from what I remember, from what I learned, um, there's differences in communion, how they see how they see and how it's taken. Um, music, um, some don't even do music like Church of Christ, whereas some only do hymnals, like, you know, so the rest is different things like that. Um, the Holy Spirit, um, stands on things, um, on, in, in his role. Um, some of the gifts of the Spirit aren't used in some of the churches on denominations. And as far as does it matter, um, ultimately, I think as long as the church, no matter what denomination it is, as long as they preach that Jesus is the only way to, um, to get salvation um, and that works aren't how you get salvation, I think that's the main thing that matters. The other things, how they see it and how they do it, as long as it doesn't get in the way of salvation, I think it's... It's, it's annoyances more than it's bad, you know. Okay. When you say annoyances, uh, do you mean for you, for them? Or? Um, kind of both. Like, it's kind of hard, like, you know, say you have a friend that is Southern Baptist and they don't really believe in, like, you know, speaking in tongues and, um, and different gifts of spirit in church. And they visit your church and they're like... That's crazy. You you, you yeah. go to a weird church, and I'm never going back to your church because that's 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 wrong. And they go to a different Baptist church, and they're like, "Well, you got baptized in the wrong area um, church, so you have to get rebaptized." It, it's just little annoyances that here and there for the different people. I mean, like a lot of people, they don't care, but to me, it's more of annoyance. I guess. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, anything else? It looked like you were gonna say something, Jack. Well, um, she did mention there towards the end. There's. Uh, baptismal differences in a lot of the different denominations. Um, I think some of the things matter more than others. Okay. Like how you see the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, so you would say that that's something that does matter? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, because if, like with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you don't uh, believe that you need that or that to help you in your ministry, I think you're going to be injured greatly yeah. in your ministry. So I think there are definitely certain things um, that are of more importance than others. Okay. Now, um, before we, before we, I, I ask anybody else specifically, I just want to tune into Diana. Now, you grew up in, in uh, Moldova, right? And um, for those of you who don't know, um, we'll get to this later, uh, the Eastern Orthodox is kind of a big thing in, in the Russian area. Uh, and you also have experience with the uh, Baptists, right? And then obviously you have experience with the Sons of God. Um, with that in mind, uh, what difference do you see between those three? Um, I want to say that, um, like, um, I want to say the Orthodox and even Baptists, Orthodox are like mainly it's a show off. Like to what do you me, mean? It's a show off, and whatever they do, they. Oh. Like, can you give me an example? Like, what do you mean? They are crossing in their backyard, but then they cross the street, and if they see a cross, they go and blast themselves. <laughs> okay, I, I I see what uh, you're saying. And they mainly do it if somebody passes by, they do it. I got gotcha. you. If there's nobody looking around, they're like, I'm just going on. I gotcha. I'm like, really? So they do it for outward show to others. Right. Uh, okay. Um, and it's it's mainly it's like, why well, it's really close to Catholic. Okay. Um, and whatever they do, it's really close to Catholic. So if you guys know what Catholic is, mm -hmm. we're talking right now. 
Baptist. To me, it seemed like it's a dead stone. Mm. Okay. In the church I grew up in. In my brother's church, I've noticed like the, they're, they're using the Holy Spirit more, even though they don't use the speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. They think it's weird, which, you know, I thought at first too. <laughs> uh, but it's, they're trying to better themselves between each other. Okay. You know, they're like trying to out, outrun each other, you know. Uh. In church is more of a show. Like to me, I go to my brother's churches. Their sermons are great, but the people in—I mean, if you watch people, they're just doing whatever they want to do. You know, they just like I'm like, are you even listening? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, singing—it's just—it's like a—it's like a—they're going through the motion. You know? Oh, okay. Like now it's singing. Now it's this. Now it's that. Now it's that. And goodbye. Everybody leaves. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, I don't know, it's just it's been so strange, just like, can I not go, you know? Well, all the things you mentioned, it must have been hard to go from that to, you know, this, which is uh, worlds apart, I think. Well, when I when I started going to Pentecostal, it was different because I was curious. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, look at that. <laughs> of course, speaking in tongues is like... I've never heard of myself in the world that, you know? <laughs> yeah. But now looking back to what I go went through at that moment seemed normal. It's mm -hmm. like, well that, this is how things run, this is how it's supposed to be. So I didn't think of anything different. Hmm. You know, I didn't know any better, so I just did what everybody else is doing. Now looking back I'm like, Wow, what a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> Are you recording that? Oh, well, anyway, you know. If you'd like to send her a letter. I'm <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I feel bad for the people that they're going through the same thing I went through. And they yeah. Don't know it. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's more on traditions. Yeah. Of what they've done it, they're just keeping going on. Oh, yeah. My mom said that recently they started doing the singing like we do. Then somebody preaches at the end, that's it. People are kind of like, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, because they're used to one way and now, mm -hmm. wait a minute, what's going on? So, and there's a lot of traditions of how you dress, what you wear, hmm. your makeup, and stuff like that. Anybody else, what difference exists between denominations and does it matter? Honestly, I think uh, depending on the denomination, the way, what type of dress is allowed. Okay. So I know more with Southern Baptists, it's more formal, but then there's others that are like, okay, as long as you're appropriate, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Rather than always being, you know, dresses and suits. Yes, you have to. I was telling Gracie this summer when they had the vacation Bible school, the leader said, if you're showing up, for the staff member, the you know volunteer, if you show up with anything shorter than your knees, I'm gonna make you a clown. I'm gonna dress you up as a clown. So I better not see you with stuff underneath, uh, above, the knee. above in the knees. <laughs> hey, those shorts are do or capris or whatever they call. And hey, Grace, you're good too. You're not a clown either. Sorry. <laughs> Zach, Zach, you're a clown. Zach, you're a clown. Hey, okay. <laughs> I'm home. You're going to be a clown. <laughs> so that, that kind of leads into the next question. Did anybody else have anything to say before I go to the next question? Um, that leads to the next question. Are traditions bad? I think... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, piggybacking off of Diana's and Chuck's um, answer to the last one, I think they're bad when it comes to... Not being able to reach out to more people. And okay. Physical, you know, with, with the dressing and everything. Um, if that denomination isn't growing, you know, yeah. substantially, not just new births into the denomination, but actually getting new people, new mm -hmm. families, then chances are the traditions and the things that they do differently aren't making an effect on people. Yeah. So it's making it bad. Now, that's important because as, as a small church, small town church you kind of have to there's a there's a little bit of a balance between we're never going to be a real big church so we just have to maintain 
Well, yes, in a way, you are limited in your evangelism, evangelism efforts if your town is small. Right. Um, but in another way, it's like, well, you see what I mean? There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a ground between just maintaining and, and reaching beyond what you're capable of. I think that's really a good thing you mentioned there. Um, okay. So, well, Chuck, you go ahead with yours, and I'll... Well, <clears throat> I, I think that traditions can definitely be bad because you in a way you basically turn the tradition into your god mm, instead yeah. of actually following god right. um i was listening to skip heitzig uh here a while back and he was talking about when he was younger and he was living over in california uh that he had asked this girl out they worked together and he asked her out and she belonged to like a real strong Catholic family and that and the first place that he he took her was to a Christian concert and she did not like that at all and so they they argued for a good while and stuff like they would still go out some and stuff but they would just mostly argue right and so one day um, he he said that they were in they worked at a hospital there and he said that they were in the um, parking garage and he he tells her is this when are you going to get saved oh crap <laughs> and he said that she actually started crying and she's like actually i need to get saved oh because God. she had been just hanging on to her family's religious traditions all her life and she didn't actually know who jesus was and so she got saved and her dad was not happy oh. like she went back home and he had given her a Bible and stuff, you know, yeah. and her dad, like, one day he went to go pick her up, and her dad was like, Skip, we need to talk. Okay. <laughs> and things did not bode well, you know, and I think traditions can be bad because you get so focused on the tradition that you lose your actual relationship with God. Yeah. Hmm. You lose your focus. Yeah. But, see, I want to say this, that when I grew up as a Baptist, I didn't know there were traditions. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't know that this, to you, it's like, this is how it is. Yeah, right. Like a Baptist, if you want to yeah. grow as Baptist, this is how it is. It's not like, oh, we're going to wear this, or we're going to do that. I thought, well, because in the, in the world, like, as I grew up, as I mean, when I was little, and my grandma still wore to dogs, they, they did all these things. And for us to be Baptist, we had to be, to do these things to like make us different, yeah. you know, like you can't drink, you can't be arguing, you can't be swearing, and or like wearing a thing around your head for married women. Like now I look, it's a tradition, but at that time it was like identifying somebody that, oh yeah, if she wears that, that means she's married, you know. Yeah. So like when I grew up, it's like well. I didn't think of it as a tradition, but it's a, it's a dis, like a, separ not separation, but like, distinction. Yeah, between world and yeah. you know us Christians. So I don't know. I We're look at it both ways, you know. Yeah, yeah. So good and bad. If you're in it, you don't know it's a tradition. Mm -hmm. If you're out of it already, then you look back and like, oh yeah, that was a tradition. Mm. You know. Yeah. The the funny thing is, Nicole. Um, the church atmosphere that I grew up in, um, you know, a lot of us wouldn't be allowed in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're wearing pants and you got short hair. You'd be out. And I have a piercing. Oh, yeah, and you have a piercing, and your hair has been dyed. You wouldn't be out on. You wouldn't be allowed in like a couple. Di Gracie, you've got pants on. Your hair's too short. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, all the women here are wearing pants. Like, the atmosphere pants. that I grew up in, like. You know, and that was, like Diana was saying, that was hard to look past. Yeah. When you start understanding, wow, there's a lot of stuff that we that we try and push on people that's actually, yeah. you know, nothing to do with anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, like, we we started out in Assembly of God, and then we went to Nazarene. And we went there for a few years. Mostly just dead. <laughs> really, really, really dead. And then... Uh, we actually did uh, some Baptists, a little bit of Baptists on that, and so 
you you see the differences. And like I, I had a friend who was uh, apostolic Pentecostal. You know, could only wear the suits. You're only saved if you speak in tongues. Wow. Uh, on to the next question. <laughs> I want to add something. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Like when I go to my brother's church, they still don't do, you know, color your nails, wear your beauty. I don't wear earrings. I still do a little makeup. Why I do it? I think it's because since they grow in that mentality and they know that this is a sin, I think I'm trying not to make somebody stumble mm. over that. Because since my brother is a pastor, I don't want somebody to go to him and say, well, your sister can, why can't we? Yeah. Because I'm already making pass in the church and causing yeah. sin. For, well, sin. I mean, I'm making somebody to fall right. into that because that's their belief. Right. So I don't do that. Yeah. You know, I'm right. like, okay, once I leave that place, yeah. then I go back to normal. You know, right. so, you know the, the thing is, though, you can always tell where legalistically a church is at by looking at how they treat the New Testament. Yeah. If they treat the things that Paul said in you know in his letters about like for instance the earrings and stuff, if they treat those as though they are additions to the law, mm -hmm. things that you have to do to be saved, That's you can true. tell that like yeah, exactly, you can tell that they are not a that they are a more legalistic church. Whereas if they see the New Testament as more of how it how Paul was trying to apply the the gospel to his generation, Basically, like what she was saying, so that people wouldn't stumble, so that they could have the greater influence on others. Um, then chances are the church is, is, is less legalistic. You can really gauge it by how they see, how a church views the New Testament. Um, so, what traditions do you feel are ignored but shouldn't be, or aren't ignored but should be ignored? This can be in our church, it can be in another church, it can be in Christianity in general. Um, I want to say one thing that really, really bothered me at first. Okay. Which I think it has to do with different churches how they run it. Communion. Like when I grew up, a communion was only allowed to take the person that's been saved, baptized, and also they know what communion means. Yeah. Because if you take it just not knowing that somebody walks from the street and take it, to me it thought, I mean, we've been raised, that's a sin because you don't know what you're doing, first of all, and the pastor should announce. This is what it means, and this is what it represents, and all the stuff. Mm -hmm. So you, if you don't know what you're doing, obtain yourself from it, you know. So when I came here, and everybody's taking, I'm like, wait a minute. They don't know what they're taking, and it's a sin, you know. And I had a hard time <laughs> dealing with it, you know. And I still kind of like, to this day, I don't know which one is right, you know. Because if you ask somebody, I even in the Bible... I mean, Jesus only did the communion with his disciples. They're all saved, they're all baptized. Mm -hmm. But he didn't say who is to partake to it. Why did we separate that from who should take and why our church says that everybody can take? You know, that's a tradition to me that it's ignored and it shouldn't be. Okay. Or were I don't I don't know. <laughs> okay. Good. Anybody else or anything else? Another thing would probably be in infant baptisms. Okay. Um, in my eyes, I I see it as more of a personal choice, not something that can be forced on me. So you feel like that should stop? Okay. Well, one thing I really had a hard time was when coming to this church was them baptizing like you know. You know, seven, eight-year-olds just mm -hmm. because they wanted to get into the baptism, and I really had a hard time with that because, for one, they don't really know what they're doing, and no. then two, um, 
it just didn't seem right to me. But, you know, after it was explained, you know, just... I don't know, I, I guess I'm okay with it now after the pastor explained it to me. But it, it, it just, I really had a hard time with that. And, and then same with them, like, you know, the kids taking communion. If they don't know what they're doing, it kind of seems almost, almost blasphemy to me, almost, you know. Okay. Yeah. One thing I'll mention on the baptism. I, I was baptized at a fairly young age. I don't remember exactly how old I was when I was baptized. Yeah. But looking back, I wished I would have waited until yeah, I understood yeah. it better. Yeah, I was like 12 and I still didn't really oh, understand I was it. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I wouldn't say I was six. Because I kind of feel like I was kind of pushed into it. Yeah. I, I wasn't, but um, and I understood what it meant, but I never felt like I was really truly saved yeah. um, and uh, after the fact. I felt like I was a Christian when I was a kid, but then after the fact... I really didn't feel like I was like I was truly a Christian because I was like, well, I was doing, I, you know, what separated me just because I, I read my Bible every yeah. week, like I went to church. Is that what really separated? You know, and, and it really wasn't until I was like 18 or so that I really felt like I, my faith became my own. So it, it's kind of, I'm kind of up in the air about it. Personally, I would have waited. I think if you could do it over again, if I could do it over again, I would have waited. Well, I wasn't. Baptized until I was like 16, 17. Yeah. Catholic, oh, okay. and I was the last one. You were you were baptized Catholic? Yes. Huh. This is news to me. Wow. What? When, when was that? You were 16 or 17. Was it here? Yeah. Or actually, I'm at St. Joseph's. Oh, okay. It's the one in Mescalero. Did you? No. They sprinkled you or what? It was head first. Huh. Just in a in a little. Oh, okay. Oh, I, where was it? The, in Mescalero? In Mescalero. Okay. St. Joseph's. That nice one there on the on that curb there? Yeah. Oh, that, that has a right. really nice building. Yeah. <laughs> so did you grow up Catholic? No. Oh, they so just decided one day to take you up there? My <laughs> mom and my stepdad decided to go while well, we were living in California. Uh -huh. And I'm going to a Irish... Catholic church. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, my brother and I were spending a big with my dad's. So I had no idea, we had no idea that they were, you know, planning to go there. So automatically, the next weekend, uh, it was just normal, you know, sleeping type of thing, da da da. Because uh, when my after once my dad and my mom got married, we didn't really go to church unless I was with my grandparents, my great grandparents, yeah. on both sides of my grandparents. Well, they all went to church when we were when we were uh, staying there for the uh, summer or, or after from school. That's when we go to church. But other than that, my parents didn't really go to church. My dad, my dad was kind of forced to be in the church. And that's why he mentioned once when he married my mom, not getting baptized, not getting just kind of cut that off. Of. So I grew up not going to church yeah. all these years, huh. and all of a sudden at 14, and going, and then all of a sudden going to church and like. What the heck? <laughs> I was, I that was, was a culture shock. Yeah, it was. I was just standing, doing all the, the traditions. Yeah. But I have no idea what this I mean. So what what denominations do you have experience with? You have Baptist, you have Sons of God, what else? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not Baptist, you have Catholic. Catholic, yeah, Okay. That's it. And you just have Baptist and Assemblies of God, right? Me? Yeah, yeah. That you were, okay. And then you just Assemblies of God? Okay. Baptist and Assemblies of God. And okay. there may be one or two others in there. I don't exactly remember because I've been to so many church. <laughs> so you have experience with, let's see, Nazarene, <laughs> Assemblies of God. Nazarene, Baptist, Southern Baptist. Um, Methodist, right? Methodist, a little bit. Um, Non-denominational. Mm -hmm. Uh, Potter's House, <laughs> whatever yeah, that is. Yeah, I've been there once. Um, 
Actually, the only one I've never been to really is Catholic. Really? Right. Oh, wow. Huh. Growing up in a Catholic community, yeah, I've never been Okay. To and then also, I've been to <clears throat> the, uh, Jew, the Jewish... Um, oh, yeah, the Jewish... Big church. Jew. Yeah. In, in Alberta? No, here. The, this one here? Right here. Um, Lupe. Oh, the Jehovah's Witness. Oh, Jehovah, Jehovah. yes. Oh, Jehovah's Witness, okay. I mean, he said, I thought we were talking about a Jewish place. I was like, there's Jews around here? <laughs> yeah, I knew, that's how I was saying. No, no, I meant the, yeah. I, I, How'd you like that, friend? It was weird. <laughs> very, very weird. Well, I gotta push it on because it's already 7, 7.20. Question. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I do want to say this. A lot of the things, I'm, I'm not going to get too much into going real deep. Because it was, when we were talking about the cults, we looked at a lot of doctrine then, okay? And so I've had to really limit this, and so a lot of stuff's going to be very, very um, drive-by, okay? Um, when I'm going to mention, first thing I'm going to mention is, is, is kind of like the history of Christianity, uh, real briefly, so you can kind of get a bigger picture. But this is actually a real good place to start if you're interested, is by uh, Huster Gonzalez. Um, he's actually... Um, one of the main authorities on Christian ch on church history. Okay, so if, if you're interested, um, it's a two volume set. Um, if you'd like to look at that, you can. I'll put them right here if you'd like to look at them. Uh, I very much so recommend them. It, it's a little bit. It, he doesn't use small words, so it's not like there, there's another book I have um, by Shelley. I forget his first name, but something Shelley. Um, I think it's called uh, Church History Simplified, or, or I actually got it from you. Oh, um, no, it was um, church history in simple English or something like that. Um, anyways, if you like that, no, it's a thick one. Uh, I have it on the back. Um, if you'd like, I can I can look that up for you. But so this is the basic idea, okay? Um, at the time of Jesus, uh, the the world power at the time was Rome. Right? It was the Roman Empire, pretty much, and they and they went from Italy all the way over past past Israel, okay? So they had this huge section, and, and I'll show you on a map here. Uh, in fact, I'll just go to it right here. Boop. Um, you can kind of see over here. Um, where is the map? Where is it? There it is. Okay. So here's Italy. True history in plain language. Yes. Bruce Shelley, that's his name. Um, here's Italy here. And uh, they eventually were moved over here to, to, to England. I'm sorry, over here. To England. <laughs> Don't know why I went over there. Uh, over here to England, but they never really got the whole thing. In fact, uh, one of the emperors, Hadrian, built a wall and kind of had his, this is my mark, and that's, in fact, I think it's still there, Hadrian's wall in, in, in England. I think it's still a thing. But anyways, um, and then they, here's, uh, here's Israel over here, and it just kind of went over here, but then they kind of hit a brick wall, okay? Now, this map obviously has a lot of stuff in it, so just don't, don't overlook the main thing that they're saying here, okay? Um, anyways, Jesus died, you know, sometime in the in the early 30s, uh, somewhere. And what happened was, it, it pretty much, it wasn't too long after he dies that that the Pentecost happens in the Book of Acts, and 3,000 people get saved in one day. Now that's actually kind of a big deal because a lot of the Jews from around the Roman Empire were in Jerusalem for for that celebration, and uh, so as they left. They took Christianity to their different cities, and that's probably how uh, how the Church of Rome got started. Um, afterwards, Peter ended up there, and Paul ended up there, and they both ended up dying there. Um, but that's how it kind of spread to, to Rome. Uh, and then, you know, it just kind of kept kept doing its thing like that. But the persecution got pretty intense after, you know, 100s AD. Um, and the, what the church started doing is they started uh, giving answers to, to what people were, were um, coming in against them with. And this is where we get the church fathers. You know, um, I can't think of any of them right now, but, you know, um, he wrote that. I can't remember them right now. But, you know, the church fathers like um, Augustine, uh, Clement, Origen. Um, you know, all of them, you know, the, the ones that you hear about, them, that, this is when they happened, from the hundreds to about the 300 somewhere. Um, and the persecution got more and more intense until finally they actually thought that they were in the time of the Great Tribulation, like the book of Revelation talks about, it got so intense. 
Um, and, and then finally, out of nowhere, an emperor named Constantine, uh, which you probably know him, uh, <laughs> uh, long story short, made the church kind of imperialized. It became synonymous with the Roman Empire. Um, Christianity was one with being Roman. And uh, so that they kept they kept growing and whatnot, but eventually what happened is there developed a, a, a kind of rift between the western side of the empire and the eastern side of the empire. And you know, over in the east, they'd start making their own choices without clearing with the west, and the west would kind of do the same. And they just kind of started getting further and further apart until finally in 1045 there was there was what called the what's called the east west schism. Okay. Basically, what that means is that the Western Church separated itself from the Eastern Church. Right. Now, the Eastern Church didn't have much of anywhere to go because of the spread of um, Islam to the south and to the east. So, where do you think they went? North to Russia. And this eventually became the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is why it's so prevalent in places like Moldova, uh, is because of that. Um, the pro remember, Protestantism wasn't a thing yet. That was until the 1500s. So, it was just... The, what it was called the Catholic Church. Catholic is, is a term that means general, the, the, the broad church. Okay, So if you're a Christian, you were Catholic. It was one and the same. Um, but it, it, with the schism, you know, obviously there were, there were different sects of, sects of Christianity and, and different things like that and uh, different heresies that they were combating. But by and large, the church was, was one thing until the East-West Schism. But it, it had been building up for a while. This is just the official date. Okay. Um, Meanwhile, the West eventually became, long story short, once again, this is way oversimplified, but eventually became the Roman Catholic Church that we know today. Catholic. Um, once again, these are way oversimplified. For instance, the Eastern Church, the Ortho Eastern Orthodox, is actually um, a family of four different related churches, which then have their own denominations and have their own sects of those denominations, and then just like Catholicism has its own branch house and stuff like that. So there's this whole big complicated thing that I'm trying to make really simple, and it's just not that simple. <laughs> so anyways, long story short, the two, the two branches of Christianity continue to develop, continue to, to, to combat heresy in their own way because they have their own isolated problems until finally in the 1500s, a guy named Martin Luther um, decides that things are just too off and he can't handle it anymore, so he posts his 95 Thesis on the door, and uh, that's where the Reformation started. Uh, as many people have noted there is nothing special about Martin Luther. Um, he just came at the right time. It was just, it was waiting to happen. If it wasn't him, it would have been someone else within a decade. Like, it was just building for too much. There was too much dissatisfaction, too much uh, corruption, chaos, absolutely. Um, and so this is where the Protestant churches came from. Uh, Protestant would be churches like Baptist, the Methodist. Those are all considered Protestant churches, okay? So more broadly, you can see it as the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. Because Eastern Orthodox, I actually said, is kind of similar to uh, Roman Catholic. And you know, the thing is, is they see themselves as miles apart, that they can never be rectified. And the truth is, they really aren't that far off. But it, I mean, you know, it's whatever. Um, but, okay, so in simplest of terms, we can make it two different organisms, Catholic and Protestant, okay? Right. But once again, this is way simplified because Methodist is technically Protestant and technically so is Assemblies of God. But they're a lot different. Technically, Baptist is a lot different than us, but we're still Protestant. So, I mean, so they're, they're, it's kind of not so easy, but I'm trying to make it easier, okay? Um, and then, uh, lo uh, lo uh, long story short, there's the idea of further revelations. Um, for instance, Catholicism, the Pope has what's called um, infallibility. Basically, if a Pope is recognized by the Church, and not all Popes of, of the history of, of Roman Catholicism are recognized as, as legitimate. Um, there are some that are disputed. Um, but if, if they are seen as you know, some of the correct line, they believe that first off, the power was handed down to them from Peter. Which obviously then they would say that the Church of Rome was started by Peter because it's very important to establish Peter is the root of everything um, for, for Catholic tradition. Um, and so anyways, what that means is everything that a pope says is basically he can overwrite scripture basically. So there is that. Um, and then also there's the further revelations that a lot of people claim. Jehovah's Witness claim a special further revelation. Mormonism claims a special uh, revelation. And technically they're considered part of Christianity in the broadest sense. Even though we know them as cults, they are considered Christianity. Okay, because they have the same elements. They have the God, Jesus, you know, that kind of stuff. They the same elements, just, you know, obviously 
We're, right. Well, I don't want to get off topic here, right. but we'll, so let's continue in. Um, and then uh, further re revelations and spiritual encounters, like for instance, the Assemblies of God was started about 100 years ago uh, at a revival called the Azusa Street Revival um, in California or something like that. Um, long story short, uh, you know, then here's the Assemblies of God. We aren't that old of a denomination. So there's that. Um, and then there's there's different opinions. You know, there's... there's um, um, you know, it, the Assemblies of God was formed from people who came from all kinds of different backgrounds, and so Baptists and, and Methodists and all these different things. And as they formed this new thing, you know, there's there's a lot of different opinions and then a lot of different speculation, and, and so it just kind of all got hodgepodge together. So the psh, psh, got kind of got split in two until finally the the empire got split in two. Until finally the the western end of the empire, this area over here, eventually fell. And the Pope was still, that stuff was still, the Western Church was still there. The Empire fell, though. And so what happened is it became a bunch of different warring kingdoms, like you probably know France and England and that kind of stuff. See what I mean? Where they became warring kingdoms, but the Pope was still there. So as a result, the Pope got a lot of power. Um, it even became the, became the point where, where the Pope crowned Charlemagne, the new emperor, to revive the empire, even though technically the Eastern Empire still existed. See what I mean? <laughs> and uh, the Pope's got a lot of say-so in who, who became king and what war should happen. In fact, the King James Bible, translated in 1611, was actually a king's attempt uh, to earn good graces with the religious aspect of things so that he could, could get, away, get away with what he wanted to do. Um, and so to make the make the church happy, he had the King James translation translated. Um, so that brings us to the question: Why are there so many denominations? What, what happened here? Like, how did we go from one church, we're all either Christian or not Christian, to then being the church imperialized, to then being now there's there's just all kinds of different stuff going on. And I do want to mention that when the church became part of the Roman Empire, they became imperialized. Right. This was when monks started, the monastic communities. Because what people did is some people said, you know what? There are people who left the faith back when we were in times of tribulation before we were imperialized. And they shouldn't be allowed to come back. Because they left when the going was hard, they shouldn't be allowed back. There were some pastors who were ostracized because they gave up the scripture. They had, you know, they had their scriptures. And... In order to save their congregation, they had to give it to give it up to the to the to the Roman authorities, and because they did that, their congregations then said, "You have sinned because you've destroyed what God gave us." So even though the pastors did it to save their congregations, they were held as sinners. So then there was there were all these different people, and then there were people on, on the other extreme that said, "You know what? The very fact that Christianity is now imperialized shows how far we've fallen," and so then they went off and started monastic communities, monks. And so you had all these different sects of Christianity that were developing before the church was officially split. So, you know, this is this is a long time building. Um, the Arian uh, uh, heresy that got going in the 300s, 200s, 300s, um, uh, you know, that that's another thing of, of, you know, hey, Jesus wasn't really fully human and fully God, you know, all these different things. Uh, you know, and, and so it, it had been building for a long time. And any time you have something that's, that's you know, uh, like that, you're going to have things that come up. Um, and, and so what it comes down to is a series of questions that different people arrived at different answers with. The first question that different people got different answers with was, is the Bible an authority? Is the Bible an authority? And some Christians said, well, maybe it's an authority, but it's not like it has absolute authority. Some Christians said, no, it really has no effect on us. And some Christians said, yes, it is the only authority. So you had this really this sway uh, of people answering this question differently, and that caused different denominations. But then there was another question. Is the Pope or another person an authority figure? Because whereas the Western Church had the Pope, the Eastern Church had this other guy, I forget what his name was, and they had their own thing that, that, that developed instead of the Pope. Because, once again, the Pope was in the West, not the East. <laughs> so, you know, you had this this, this separation that they got going there. Um, did, was that Ben at the door? No? Okay. Um... So, the, so is the Pope or another person an authority? If he, if this person is an authority, how great of an authority? Over the Bible, under the Bible, equal with the Bible? You know, we really have a lot of questions there. And different people asked, answered in different ways, which led to more denominations. But wait, there's more! Do you understand your authorities view correctly? Because some people then said, okay, well, this is what they said, but I think they meant this. And these people would say, no, I think they meant this. 
There are more denominations, but wait! If you call now, there's more! <laughs> what place do, uh, do works have in our salvation? Some people would say, okay, works are absolutely essential. If you do not have works, you are not saved. Some people would say, yeah, but works flow from salvation. Other people would say, works lead to salvation. But then other people said, okay, so you're saved by grace, but then you still have to be continued in that faith by works. Like, for instance, we're saved by believing in Christ, but then if we aren't baptized, we're not saved. See what I mean? And so you had a lot of different views and a lot of different people answering these questions differently. And this is the last main question I want to mention. How important are the traditions? Because some people answered them as very important, and they they couldn't stand the people who said they're not very important at all. Right. See what I mean? Yeah. So therefore, more traditions there. I mean, more denominations there. So this is a long series of people having different opinions and not getting along with each other. Right. And because they couldn't get along with their variances of opinions, they created their own. They created their own exactly. They created their own denominations, their own churches. They separated themselves from other people because they were the true, so, truly saved, and nobody else was. And so on and so forth. So, uh, I know that's kind of a big uh, uh, answering a question with a question it might not be the best idea, but nevertheless, that's what it comes down to. Different people answer these questions differently. Okay. Now, uh, the next uh, thing would then become what are the major groupings? Well, I've already kind of hinted towards this. Eastern Orthodox is the first one I want to mention. They were they were the eastern part of the East West Schism. And they, they have their own denominations and their own off-branches and their own stuff going on there, their own sects and everything. Then there's the Catholic Church. This is way oversimplified because technically you should say there's the Western Church, which encompasses things like the, uh, what are they called, the Hussites and, you know, all those different people plus the Protestants. And, well, technically you should include that. Yeah. However, for the sake of keeping things simple, I've decided to just say the Catholic Church. Um, and then there's the Protestant Church. Now, once again, this is so broad because this can further be be separated into, for instance, Charismatic Protestant. The Pentecostal Church, what we are, is technically a Charismatic type of, uh, of, uh, of, of Protestantism. Methodism is technically a type of Protestantism. Nazarene is technically a part of Protestantism. So in these different denominations of Protestantism, there's more or less legalistic, to very, un very unlegalistic. You know, you have different extremes there. So you have this huge spectrum, and so it's not so easy to give me, you know, the, the breakup. But once again, there are history books that you can, if you really want the specifics of how we got all the different things that we've got going on. Um, once again, this does not include all sects of Christianity or subgroups. And it also doesn't uh, list cults, okay? So keep this in mind when you're looking at these three major groupings, okay? And keep in mind that this is so oversimplified that if there was someone here from from the, an Eastern Orthodox tradition, they'd probably get mad at me for saying that there's just three three groupings. Right. If there was someone here from the Western branches, they'd probably get mad at me for this. And if there was someone here from Protestant, they probably wouldn't care. <laughs> <laughs> just because it's kind of the nature of Protestantism to not care. It's like, I don't know, whatever. Um, so there's differences from each other and themselves, but these vary um, from worlds apart to slightly different. You know, they just some of them are worlds apart. Like Eastern Orthodox are worlds apart from the sons of God. They're just worlds apart. But some of these just aren't that aren't that separate from each other. Um, and then there's kind of to make things even more complicated. There's broad variations of doctrine. Let me kind of tell you what I mean. Do they all do they all believe in the same God? So broadly, yes. Okay, but views about that one God may vary. Okay, some people see him a lot differently than, for instance, Jews technically worship the same God as us, technically, except that they reject the full revelation of that God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Right. So, technically, no, they don't. It's kind of a yes, I don't know. Um, Catholicism technically has the same God as us, but Jesus' death means something different to them. So it brings up the question, is it the same God? Well, I'll let you you resolve that in your own mind. Do they all believe in salvation by Jesus Christ? Most broadly, yes, kind of. But many believe that the salvation has to also include a works-based element of some kind. For instance, the Catholic Church doesn't believe, and I'll get into this when I, you know, later, but they don't really believe that Jesus died, Christ died once for all time, and that's good enough, and just leave it at that. Um, I, I'll get into this in just a second, but... 
they kind of don't really. And they say that they do, but then they also supplement it with other works, like the seven sacraments and stuff, where, like, when you were baptized, for instance, it's not just being baptized. No. You know, you have there's, like, a confession part, then there's a the baptism yeah. part. Then there's, they give you, like, this sash-looking thing. It's like a, what is it called? A... No, well, no. M maybe, but I think it's called. It's like a. No, the rosary is the. Best. What's it called, yeah. Chuck? It, it's like a. It's like a. It's not. It's not a sash, but it's kind of like a sash, except it goes. Um, kind of, and they and they wrap it around you. It's. I, I'm I'm explaining it like a like a total idiot, but I, I bet you you guys know what it is if I just remember what it was called. Anyways, um, you know, and then they have all these different things, and 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 so it's kind of like, well, I don't know. Uh, do they all believe the Bible is the final authority? And the simple answer to that is no. No, they don't. Um, the Catholic Church, for instance, does not believe that the Bible is the final authority. Um, they believe that, in all seriousness, they believe that the Pope is at least an equal authority with the Bible. At least. So, you know, from that, some people even go even further and say, you know, I don't even need to read the Bible. I've got the tradition of my family, like Chuck was mentioning. You know, I've got... Yeah. And so it's really kind of a hard question to answer, but mostly no. They do not all believe that the Bible is inspired. In fact, even nowadays we're seeing a defining line in Protestantism. Uh, Method a lot of uh, uh, Methodism, for instance, is allowing homosexuals to be pastors. And I'm not talking about people struggling with homosexuals. I mean people who have homosexual partners, and them and their partner are leading a church. Do you know what I mean? Um, I believe there was the Methodist Church. Don't quote me on that, guys. Um, it might have been. Was it? Um, I, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyways, uh, and there's are other denominations that are doing that as well. Um, and so it's like, well, is the Bible the final authority? Well, yes and no. If you take it clear, black and white, then no. If you allow for a lot of gray room, then maybe. Right. So. Scapular. What? Scapular. No, that's not what I was gonna say. Um, it's in it's it's like the fourth right of uh, the seven sacraments. It's like the fourth, uh, not right, the fourth uh, sacrament, or something like that. It's like a, a ribbon, like yeah, kind of like a ribbon. It looks like it has these um, little tufts on it. Cincter. Hmm. C i n c t u r. I thought it was something with a c. Well, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll, I'm sure we'll find out later. Uh, so, but then here's the thing: our doctrines that we have as the sons of God are also often cont contested. The first one, the rapture. Uh, this is oftentimes argued against because the word rapture never appears in the Bible. But here's the thing, though: a lot of words don't appear in the Bible. We give words to an idea that we see in the Bible. Does that make sense? Yeah. For instance, the Bible shows a Trinity, but the word Trinity doesn't ever appear in the Bible. We have created the word Trinity, triunity, three oneness, to show the character of God because it the Bible didn't give us a clear definition you know right. it just showed us the example it didn't say by the way you guys are going to call this a trinity and this is what that means <laughs> it's like a it's like a four leaf clover or it's like a banana or it's like an egg no the Bible never says that you know what I mean it just leaves this big gap in our understanding of yeah you're not getting any further clarification yeah. is Jesus God yes is there only one God yes is God the Father God yes those aren't two different gods. No, there's one God. But then there's this other guy, the Holy Spirit, too. And he's not a third, he's not a separate God? No. One God. Okay. You see what I mean? It doesn't ever explain it. You can give you can give theories and stuff on your how you understand it, like the thing with the egg. But all those analogies fall short because each of those parts of the egg ha would have to be the entire egg. Right. See what I mean? So, obviously. Um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, this is something that's, uh, even in Protestant traditions that this is something that's kind of yeah you know maybe it was once upon a time but not so much now speaking in tongues a lot of people believe that speaking in tongues only has to be in a known language and that the person who spoke is the only person who can give an interpretation um, so there are a lot of differences on that too uh, baptism and com communion can you give these things to people who are not members of your church can you give the uh, do these things to people who have not openly proclaimed that they're Christian in front of you like Diana was saying, yeah. how do we know that these people coming in off the streets taking communion? How do we know that they are saved? Right. See what I mean? That brings up a whole set of questions. Um, you know, uh, should should membership depend on these things? 
See what I mean? We have a lot of different Christians, and guess what? Depending on the different opinions that people have had, more denominations have been started. <laughs> so obviously this is something that somebody felt was so important that they left their church for, obviously, and started another denomination, so obviously these aren't just simple questions to gloss over. Um, Israel's place in the future. Some people would say they have no place in the future. They've completely lost it. Other people would say, well, God originally intended to save them, but then because of their hardness of heart, heart they just lost their own place. Other people would say, yes, they are still essential. Other people would say, we are included in Israel, etc., etc., etc. Traditionally, in the sense of God, Israel is still held in uh, honor. Yes. Uh, and to some ex to, to a large extent, most people in the AG still believe that, the, that Israel has a, a place in the future. Um People do argue with the, with the SMB God about that. When and how the end times will take place. Some people yeah. think that there will be a persecution and then a rapture. Some people think um, rapture and then a persecution. Yeah. And then some people think there will be no rapture. It'll just go persecution until all of a sudden Jesus comes back. And So, you know, there's yeah. variances there. And even in the SMB of God, which once again to become licensed or ordained, whatever, you have to agree to their 16 fundamental truths. And yet there's a lot of people who don't actually agree with the thing that they say that they agree with, so I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> oh, no, I, I'm, I'm a sense of God. I just don't believe in that. Well, yeah, so are you a sense of God? <laughs> um, and I kind of have a hard time with this, too, because are, there are quite a few uh, doctrines that, that I have a hard time with teaching. Um, yeah. For instance, I'm not so sold on the idea that we're going to be raptured before we go through persecution. I'm not so sold on that idea. It seems it seems like in the Bible that we're going to go through a lot of persecution. There's going to be signs that we're going to know what's going on, but everybody else is going to be given a delusional spirit. They're going to be misled, and they're not going to listen to us. And we're like, hey, that, that's exactly what it says here about the man of lawlessness. Remember all this? And they're going to say, well, you guys are just crazy. So, I mean, I, I honestly feel like that's how it's going to go. But, you know, I mean, obviously you can hope that you'll be raptured before all that crap takes place. Yeah, whatever. Um, obviously it doesn't matter what you... What you some say that there's going to be like a select few that oh, are the 1100 left here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to still proclaim the, the good news to the people who are there. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've, I've heard about that. Um, I know some people that thought they were going to be some of those. Yeah, me too. Some people thought that they were going, that um, people could be saved during that time. Some people thought people couldn't be saved during that time. <laughs> so I've heard, I've literally heard everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Left Behind series kind of goes off that. Yeah. yeah. Which one? The uh, people being left, the or people? Some people being left. Yeah. Oh. Whatever. Um. I forgot what I was gonna say. So my on. my thinking on it honestly is it's gonna happen how it's gonna happen. That's what I was gonna say. We don't have much. I remember. Right. Yeah. It, that's what I was gonna say. You can hope and think whatever you hope and think, right. but in the end, it's going to happen how it's going to happen. It's like, ah, you know. <laughs> hey, like, Jesus, I noticed that you left me here and you took everybody else. Not cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to the YouTube last week. And I, uh, I told him, you know, that I thought Jesus could come back in my lifetime. And their eyes just get big and they're like, no, we got stuff to do. We want to get buried. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I used to say that when I was a kid. I said, that's what everybody Jesus, did. wait until I get married. Wait until I'm old and die and then come back. Like when when they say you're going to die, then you can come back. Oh my gosh. Take me. You've got, you've got two days to live and then we're pulling the plug. Okay, Jesus, right now. Come on back. I think we have a friend who thinks he's reincarnated. Oh my okay. gosh. <laughs> okay, so here are some here are some traditions. Um, I'm not mentioning all of them. These are just some some that are not really biblically oriented. The first is priests not marrying. This is actually kind of a big thing. Can pastors marry? And a lot of people have turned it into a tradition, but it really has no biblical basis. Um, the Bible does mention that some people are called to be celibate and some people are called to marry. It does mention that. Um, but it doesn't say specifically anything about people not marrying. In fact, we have no reason to doubt the fact that a lot of the people um, of the New Testament may have even been, been married. Well, Peter was married. Right? You know, I've heard that. His mother-in-law got sick and Jesus prayed for her. You know, I, I heard about that and I didn't research it, so I don't know. Uh, it, wasn't it his mother-in-law? Wouldn't that mean he was married? I didn't research it, so I can't yay or nay it. Can you do that on yeah. your phone? Um, some people think that Paul was married. Um, there is no definite proof on that. It's right. a possibility, but he doesn't mention it. In fact, he specifically says, 
I am not married. So, um... <laughs> you know, I, I highly doubt that he was married. Um, well, a lot of people have said, you know, oh, he was married because he had to be on, to be on the Sanhedrin. It never said that he was on the court. It's just that he was a very zealous Jew. That's all it says. Yeah. Luke 4, 38 through 40. What does it say? Um... Do you want me to go on and I'll come back to you? Yeah. Okay. The same thing as last rites. Uh, when somebody is dying or has just died, you know, the, a priest to come in and do their little thing. Yeah. That's not really mentioned in the Bible either. In fact, the Bible says repeatedly that at death, it's kind of, that's the end. No no more. Um, another similar thing is purgatory. Um, that the, the, I was just going to say, you mean there's no purgatory? Well, and, and here's the thing. Catholics actually believe in two different kinds of sins. There are sins that cause temporary um, temporary uh, punishment, and then there's uh, sins that cause eternal punishment. And purgatory, I, if I understand correctly, are, are for those people who died with the temporary sins unatoned for. Okay. Um, so they go to purgatory until that time's paid off, and that leads into the. I believe it leads into the whole last rites where you can uh, pray, them out. pray them out of purgatory yeah, or, or shorten yeah. their sentence or something yeah. like that. It, 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 here's the thing with Catholic Catholicism. I'll come right back. Here's the thing with Catholicism. There's a lot of varying views and a lot of different um, cultural specifics. See what I mean? If you take Catholicism here and compare it to the one in Italy, for instance, you're probably going to have a lot of differences. Oh, yeah. So it's hard to really buckle it down on what the church believes in proof definitely. You know, uh, you could go on their website. I'm sure they have, have, have statements there. But what were you going to say? When mom's brother was killed when they were kids, um, the their classmates and stuff wanted to uh, pray them out of purgatory. Yeah, how'd that go? It didn't go over so well. Yeah, your mom doesn't seem like she liked that. Yeah. Mm. Um, anyway, in Luke 4, 38 and 39, mm -hmm. it does say his mother-in-law. Well, there you go. So okay. he was married. married. The first boat was married. So some people would then say, okay, that was before Jesus. Okay. So, you know, that doesn't count. But doesn't it, though? If yeah, I think if that was a doctrine, I think they would have mentioned it in the Bible. Um, okay. <clears throat> Stigmato, you know this? Guys, this is cray cray, okay? This is where you mark yourselves, like wound yourself. Oh, yeah. Um, with a, a, it's like a symbol of, of what Christ did. In fact, there was someone, you know, wounding themselves here and here, for instance. Um, you know, and they leave scars and stuff like that. Um, it's, I don't, I didn't ever, didn't really understand the idea behind a stigmato. You're not required to get stigmato. But you can as a sign of like dedication or a sign of zeal for God or I forget something like that. But then it gets weirder, guys. They also have something called the psilis, and this is something that you wear that makes it very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's something you do like when you're fasting, for instance. It just makes you uncomfortable. It doesn't doesn't hurt you, and you're not required to wear it. But it does it does cause you great. It, it's like um, if I if I understand it's correctly, it's like it's yeah, annoying. it's like these little metal ring things that, that you wear, and um, it just causes it where you can't really get comfortable. It's just you know. Yeah, you know, um, they also have this thing called the uh, for uh, you use it for what's called self-flagellation. It's like a, a little wooden thing with yeah, these whips on it, whips. and you and you hit yourself with it um, as a means of, of fasting and showing your 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 your, penit your, your uh, penitence, uh, uh, repenting. Yes. Um, uh, you know, to show that you're grieved and also to prevent you from further sin. You know, kind of like uh, I guess spanking yourself. You think of it kind of like that if you want to. Um, a lot of different different things there. Then there's the idea of indulgences. Now these are actually still practiced. The the thing is that at the time of Martin Luther, why this was such a dividing time line for him, was <laughs> because they were charging and they were making profit off of it. Okay, and they still do indulgences. Um, but here's the thing that people don't understand about indulgences: that doesn't mean you can go out and sin however you want. There are limitations to the things that you can do. Okay. Once again, you can't do the eternal sins. I, I believe, if I understand correctly, you can't do the eternal sins. You can only do the temporary things, and it's only for certain things at certain times. So it's like the purge. Kind of, <laughs> kind of, but on a, on a smaller scale, yes. Um, I'm still not supporting it, but I just I didn't know before that it was a, a limited thing. Uh, I thought it was kind of like a get out of jail free card. I'm gonna go and murder like, somebody, so I'm gonna pay for the, the 
Amish allow the kids to go out for the Ramastein? Yeah. Kind of. Like there was a there was a festival a little while back that the Pope actually allowed for an indulgence for that day. Huh. So, um, anyways. Now these things you can take verses to support it, but they are not naturally found in Scripture. Right. They're not things that the Bible affirms. It's just something that you could technically make it out to, like you know, kind of, kind of like they did with slavery. Right. You can you can kind of make it apply to what you're saying, but it doesn't say that. Um. So some specific things. We're gonna end on three main specific things, and then we'll stop. The first one is the prayer to the saints. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I actually learned a lot from, okay? Um, the first, Catholics yeah. believe that relationships between Christians don't end at death. Huh. Okay? okay? So basically, when your loved one who's a Christian dies and they go to heaven, the relationship hasn't ended. It simply has changed. You can still, uh, in a sense, communicate with them. Not in the sense of like a seance. Not like that. But, I mean, um, they still pray in heaven. And so you can pray to them. And they will pray on your behalf, and they will give you strength for things. Okay. Now, there's a distinction made between praying to and worshiping. Okay, they believe that you can pray to them without worshiping them, and that's why they think that it's okay. So, in other words, just because you're praying to somebody, a saint or a dead relative, that doesn't mean that you are worshiping that person. You, right, and they're not your god. You just have a need, and so you're addressing your need to someone. Like you would say, um, hey, Diana, pray for me for this interview. It's not that I'm not praying myself. It's just I'm asking her to pray as well. And that's kind of how they see it, too. They're, you're, you're asking them to join you in prayer, that kind of stuff. Right. Okay? I had a confrontation about this with somebody five, six years ago. No? Yeah. How'd that go? Me nuts. No. <laughs> it didn't end well, did it? No, I could not. I could They're very hell-bent on this. I could not do it. Try telling somebody who just lost um, – somebody who, who, whose kid dies. Tell them that their child is does not turn into an angel in heaven. You'll get the fiery wrath. Oh, man. Big mistake, God. Michael. I had a battle. <laughs> yeah, some things people, I think, are, are just so hell-bent on that it's like, just let them have that one. Yeah, I <laughs> if you want to believe that your kid's it. an angel in heaven, you go for it. Who cares? <laughs> right. Um. <clears throat> Okay, praying to the saints for help or to appeal on, um, on our behalf, okay, like, like for instance, Hebrews mentions the crowd of witnesses, they would then say, yes, that's a crowd of, of Christians in heaven that are, you know, watching us, and they pray on our behalf and that kind of stuff, um, you know, they take it a little bit, maybe a little bit too far, I think, um, but anyways, um, and then there's something called a um, patron saint, just to say, there's something called a patron saint, and that basically means the protecting or guiding saint of a person or place. This is where they lose me. This is basically the idea that was in the old occult world, that there are certain gods or, or, or divine beings that rule over certain areas. That's basically what a patron saint is. I mean, you can sugarcoat it all you want, but that's basically what it is. It gets a little dark there. I, I would very much so uh, draw the line on that one. Uh, but one thing that's very definite on this is that they definitely do blur the line of trust and worship of the individual. Are you trusting in that individual? Because sometimes they definitely do lean to that. Are you worshiping that individual? Because a lot of times they lean to that too. Catholics kind of get weird with death. And they kind of, if you've ever been to their funerals, you know. Like, it just gets dark. And they have an open gap. Well, that's not even the part that I'm talking about. I'm talking about more like the the funeral itself, like the, oh, yeah, the, yeah. there are views on it and that kind of stuff. What were you gonna say, Grace, or ask, um, or whatever? Obviously, the whole praying to the saints and relatives to pray on their behalf huh? and stuff. Isn't that what Romans says that Jesus is there for? For us to pray. To Jesus? Our mediator. Yes, that's exactly what it says. That's exactly what Hebrews says too. So why do why do they pray to the saints when they can just pray to Jesus and Jesus will do it? You know. You know that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> That's a good question. It doesn't make sense. I, I'm right there with you. you know, here, I am. Here, here's the thing. Like I heard this. It wasn't I in a Catholic a battle, And I didn't win. For weeks. I was getting so frustrated. Yeah, I remember when she was in this argument because she came to worship and she said, <laughs> And he was my best friend oh. at that time. Yeah. Which I... Well, I heard this and it wasn't even in a Catholic church. Like it was. 
they were much. trying to bring it into uh, the last church that we were at. Oh! The world that was. Oh, lady. yes. She, she starts saying one day uh, in her little Bible study thing that she did on Sunday mornings, how she had heard that we could, we could, you know, pray to the great preachers who have gone on before us and crap and ask them for help. And uh -huh. I'm just like, that's what Jesus was for. No. <laughs> like, why do I need him when I got Jesus? No, <laughs> now, here's the idea. Now, just to sit, so you can see their, their point of view, okay? Their idea is the more people you are praying for something, the better. And that's inevitably what they will say. Yeah. Well, you don't just pray everything for yourself, don't do you? You join with your church, don't you? It's like, well, yes, you know, and I see what they're saying, but that doesn't mean that I would pray to a person to pray. I would get people to pray to Jesus, and if the pe and the saints are in heaven praying to God, then I don't think I need to pray to them to pray. To him, I think that I can pray to him, and they can pray to him, and we can all pray to him, and that's that. It'll all work out. It'll all work out. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to overcomplicate this thing, but I feel like that's exactly what's been done. It's been overcomplicated. Mediator, someone in the middle to bring them in. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing that that, that makes me laugh. It's like a mediator for a mediator. Yeah, exactly. Here's God. Here's us. Here's the mediator, the person who interacts between us, Jesus. But then we need someone else between them. Hey, can you go tell Jesus to tell God to, go, uh, uh, to let hey, the Holy Spirit work in St. Paul, can you tell Jesus to tell God that I need for the Holy Spirit to get with Jesus and touch this person over here? <laughs> Wait, what? It's way too complicated. Like I said, also, it's, it puts too big of a, of, a, of a separation between the persons of the Trinity, too, I think. But anyways, that's the idea of it. bringing the... The priest back from the Old Testament back. To yes, that's exactly yeah. what it does. Uh, that is exactly what it you know is. What I mean? like, Which the, the Bible says Jesus, Jesus is our high priest. Yeah, so, you know, it's whatever. <laughs> Why do we need them? We don't. You got me, friend. You got me. Um, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Okay, so then, the, so. Long story short, prayer to the saints is not something that is advocated in the Bible. It always says pray to the Father in this way. Um, it always records people praying to God. Um, it, it never once condones or hints around the idea of praying to praying to a saint or a dead relative. Okay? Right. Um, this is something that has been taught as a tradition, and so it's now that's how it is. So, the next one is communion, also called the Lord's Supper. It goes by different names in different places. Um, there are different understandings of what it actually is, but then there's also different reasons for why it is given. We already looked at this. Um, um, some people, places say only to the members of that church. Um, some people say only to Christians more broadly, but we have to verify that you actually are a Christian more broadly. Were you going to say something? Or to that you have to uh, be at a certain age to... Yes. There are some people who put age restrictions on it, or places, I guess I should say. There are some places that... Uh, give yes, and I it, it is true. Um, sex and uh, race qualifications on it. That um, is absolutely true. I know the Catholic Church. I had a friend that um, they visited their friend's Catholic Church. Uh huh. And um, because mom, it was a different Catholic Church. Well, I don't think my friend was Catholic. I think mm. they were just going to their friend's. Oh, I got it. One yeah. Sunday. And uh, the mom didn't take communion, and they're like. Did she kill someone? Why isn't she taking communion? And it found out that she was just, it, Aunt Irma was visiting, and so she couldn't take communion because it was a certain time of month. I'm sorry, why does that matter? It, it was just... I we don't have to be ritually clean. pure anymore. Because, yeah, I guess because they weren't considered clean. Oh yeah, whatever. Um, but then there's uh, wow. three basic understandings, and once again, basic understandings of what it actually is. The L Lutheran view, which is funny because it's real close to the Roman Catholic view, which remember, this is one of the big things that Martin Luther had a problem with, and it's, <laughs> it's actually not that separate from the Roman Catholic view. Uh, Christ's body, the, the, the bread and, and, and the wine does not actually literally become the body of Christ. However, Christ's body is present in, with, and under it. But it itself is still bread and wine. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that that resolves you from the whole it's not literally his body thing, but, but, but pretty darn close to what the Roman Catholics are going to say. Blam. The bread and wine actually become Jesus. <laughs> from the moment that the priest says, this is the bread, or I'm sorry, this is the body, 
from that moment on, those things actually are Jesus' body and his blood, okay? And then when you partake it, you are literally partaking of Christ. Now, the important thing to notice with this, okay, now, now, now I know it grosses people out because I'm not drinking blood, but that's not even the big, the big thing here. The big thing here is that Roman Catholics believe that Jesus, basically, let me kind of reword this so you'll understand what I'm saying, that Jesus gets re-crucified every time that you partake of communion. This is his bread all over again. This is his blood all over again. It's not a memorial. It, you are literally repeating the thing, Be, recovering yourself with, with his with his blood, basically, re, re committing yourself in a way, um, and that's the big thing as to why the Roman Catholic view cannot really be believed in is because they don't see that Christ's atonement was one and done. It's it's done. It is all sufficient. It covers every sin for all time. They don't believe that. They believe it has to be complete, continually re-crucified every time you partake of communion. Yes. And would that be why they, they do it every week? Yes. Oh. And also, well, related, uh, but another view is uh, about that is sometimes uh, different churches believe that it has to be every time you meet. Other people believe it just has to be frequently, mm -hmm. and some people think it has to be done once a month. So once again, it's a dom denominational thing. Um, it's partly un unrelated, but okay. it partly is related. Um, I was actually going to mention something else, too, about that. Um, but yes, um, as far as what is used of... People sometimes people use real wine. Some people use grape juice. Some people use water. I mean, it just really is. You're gonna find different things every different place you go. <laughs> um, most Protestant churches uh, believe that Jesus, uh, Christ's sacrifice is symbolized by it. It is a symbol of what what Christ did. Um, it is either a memorial or Christ is spiritually present. Okay, so in other words, you are either partaking it as a memorial of what he did, right. or you are partaking it of it to symbol spiritually, symbolic. spiritually, not symbolically, but spiritually, um, partake of communion with Jesus. Okay. Spiritually. So in other words, your spirit is being fed, and Christ is with you spiritually, and he's also partaking of it spiritually. So okay. kind of there, there's a lot of different different differences of views here. Okay. Our church mostly does it as a memorial right. and a declaration. Right. We do it as a memorial because of what Christ has done. He died and rose again. But we also do it as a declaration that he is coming again. And when he does, then it will be, you know, uh, like Paul says, uh, united again with him in the air. So uh, can it be done by anyone other than a priest? Some people would say no. A priest is the only person who can give the bread and the wine. Our church has ushers, and you know, actually, the Catholic Church didn't even let the people drink the drink the wine for a long time because they were afraid that, that they might spill it. So the, the priest would drink all the wine himself. <laughs> wow. Even still, uh, in, in a lot of in a lot, a lot of places, you'll see the priest put the bread literally in their mouth on their tongue so they don't drop it. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, still, oftentimes, still, he will hold the cup. Very gingerly, okay. Um, very rarely will you see the priest hand over the cup. I still think it's gross. They all drink from the same cup. Yes, yeah. I, I, I'm with you there. I, I totally they still do think that. that. Um, and uh, so then there's a thing of can ordinary Christians partake of communion? Biblically, yes, ordinary Christians can. Uh, however, traditionally, no. Depending on the denomination, either the priest has to be present or administering it, or the pastor does, or whatever. Um, but biblically, any Christian can partake of it, as long as it's a gathering of Christians. That's the thing that separates it as communion. Okay. If you're doing it by yourself, it's more of which is something eating. that got the Corinthians in trouble. No, like it, it's something that is it. It goes on like they'll. There's even certain televangelists and stuff that they're like, we'll send you communion things and you can take communion at home all yeah. the time, anytime you want. By yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, and once again, this is a, a thing that people separate. Well, I don't like the people at my church, so I still want to do communion, but I don't really want to go to your church. And it's like, well, okay. Um, uh, yeah. Is the work of Christ sufficient? That's the second question that really comes up with the communion. If Christ's work is sufficient, it is one time for all sins for all time, then yes, Christ's death is completely sufficient, and 
we it's we don't have to re-crucify him every time we take a communion. Right. But if it's not, then yes, it is something that has to be more. Um, as far as what our church practices, I already mentioned that. So any questions on anything I've talked about so far? We're getting to the last uh, main uh, difference here. Or not difference, but the last point, a specific point. No? Okay, and that's baptism. Now, this is something that we've already talked about a lot. Uh, should there be age requirements? Um, it, do you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or just the Son? Because we have biblical examples of both. Uh, do, is it something that only a pastor or a priest can baptize? Um, does the person have to be fully submerged under the water, or can they be speckled, or can they just be dipped, or what? So it's kind of like there, there's uh, more things there. Uh, what are some other things? Yeah, that, that's all that I can think of about that comes up with the baptism for now. If I if I think of anything else, I'll, I'll mention it. But the word baptize literally means to submerge. Um, oh yes, is it necessary for salvation? That's what else. Uh, it literally means to submerge, um, and this is this is how it is used not just in the Bible but also in other literature of the time. Um, in its most narrow form, it could technically me mean to dip, in the sense of only partially, but usually it carries the connotation of submersion. Okay, um, as far as so, if I was um, baptized by a different church, like the Catholic Church, did I have to be rebaptized? No. If you were baptized by whoever, as a public declaration of your faith in Jesus Christ, you do not have to be rebaptized by anybody. By any denomination, by any church, by any priest, no, you're fine. The next thing that I brought up um, was if I wasn't submerged under the water, well, the whole symbolism of baptism is to go under and then to be raised up like Christ was crucified and then was resurrected. However, um, I really don't feel like it's necessary for you to get rebaptized if you were baptized in a different format than that. I really don't feel like that's necessary. Like you were dipped, for instance. I don't really feel like that's necessary for you to get rebaptized. I feel like if you would like to, you can. Right. But I don't feel like that's something that, that you, that you would. Be, yeah, right. Um, right. And so then the next question is: It necessary for salvation? Because some people would say, okay, Jesus said, you know, that after you're saved, you have to get baptized, right? So that means it's necessary for salvation. Well, yes and no. For instance, the person on the cross with, that died with Jesus. He said, "Today I will see you will see uh, I will, you will be with me in paradise." But he didn't never get baptized. No. Right. He accepted Jesus on the cross as he was dying. Right. Jesus died before him. Right. And he was never baptized. So did he make it to heaven? Well, Jesus said yes. However, baptism is definitely a, a sign of obedience to God. God did definitely tell us to do that. In fact, baptism takes the place of circumcision. In the Old Testament, people had to be circumcised into the law. In the New Testament, people had to be baptized. Uh, made that easier. Made yeah. that a lot easier and a lot less painful. Yeah. <laughs> a lot less painful. Um, so that's something to think about. Okay. Um, it is a public declaration of death and resurrection with Christ. That's what the symbolism of going down and up. That's the whole symbolism there. Um, oftentimes, people make it into a thing of more, and some people have attributed it to the idea of. Death, dying, and being raised, and you know, it's kind of like the, a whole different meaning. Technically, I guess it could be related with that, but biblically, the idea is here is death and resurrection with Christ. Thing, that simple. <laughs> one thing that I find kind of humorous that you, you've seen a lot more recently is people want to be baptized privately. Yeah. And it's like you want a private, public declaration of your faith. I always think that that's funny. <laughs> now, Here's the only exception I see for that. Okay, I, I know one person who's been baptized twice publicly, and this time they want to do it as more of an intimate setting because they've done it before. They just feel like they kept messing up and stuff. For that, I would say that's fine. Yeah, okay, right. You know, it, it's just it has personal symbolic meaning for you. That's fine. You know what I mean? Right. But ultimately, I would say you know you probably shouldn't be baptized until you're ready to be publicly, publicly baptized right. because that's actually. Yeah. The idea of it, a public declaration. So, um, the next thing here, uh, who can do it and how is it done? Any Christian can baptize any other Christian. Any Christian can baptize any other Christian. It doesn't have to be a priest, it doesn't have to be a pastor, it doesn't have to be a specially anointed person. Any Christian can baptize any other Christian. That simple. 
We are all, it's called the priesthood of believers. In other words, we are all God's priests. We're all his, his people. There's not one of us that's above and beyond another place. However, there are certain people that God has called for positions, like a pastor, for instance, and the Bible, Paul does clarify that. That doesn't make them more or less saved. That just means that God appointed them as over, uh, uh, like a shepherd over, over sheep, basically. Uh, but I don't really want to get too much into that. But and how is it done? It should be done by 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 baptizing them, by putting them in, uh, inducting them into the water, um, if at all possible. Uh, once again, though, if you have to settle for other things, or if it's already been done another way, that's fine. The Jehovah, they do the feet, right? The washing feet is that what they call the baptism? It, who? Or the or just the communion? Jehovah, Jehovah Witness. Uh, I think that they have. I, I don't know at this time. I used to know all kinds of stuff, but I really wasn't. I was more paying attention to the actual Christian denominations. Um, yeah, and then, and then as far as is it in the name of the Father, the Son, uh, and the Holy Spirit, or is it just in the name of Jesus? It can be either, because uh, baptizing someone in the name of Jesus is all inclusive of the work that was done there. See what I mean? Um, uh, basically, baptizing somebody in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is an expansion of, of baptizing someone in the name of Jesus. See what I mean? Yeah. So it really doesn't matter on that, because the Bible does show us examples of both. Um, baby dedication for versus baby baptism. Now, baby, now baptism is a public declaration of your faith, and so as a result, you can't really baptize someone who hasn't accepted Jesus. Um, and so then it says, well, okay, but what about your child before they are the age where they can accept for themselves? You let God handle God's business, mm -hmm. and you handle your business. However, the Bible does say a lot of things about you covering those in your household by your authority. In other words, um, it mentions, you know, with an unbelieving spouse, how your relationship with Christ cover gives them grace. Not that it saves them, but that your 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 household will not be. In other words, let's say, for instance, your wife, your husband is not saved, and he doesn't tithe. So God will not withhold punishment from you. Because your faith in God will, will cover his disobedience to God. Does that make sense? Yeah. So even though your husband will not allow you to tithe, God will still cover you and, and still bless you in light of your... Because you're, you, because you're obeying your authority, who is your spouse, hu husband's authority is his wife, and a wife's authority is his, his, his her husband. Um, <laughs> yeah. Then there's this whole other thing too, um, because it, the Bible specifically says that that the husband is actually directly under Jesus in the hierarchy. Right. It says that Jesus is the head of the husband, which means that your husband is under a greater judgment from God. Let's just put it like that. Um, so I don't want to get into that. Uh, we'll do it some other time. Um, as far as baby dedication, there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that. You just um, you are charging the church to do their best to be a good example. You're charging yourself, and you are dedicating, like Hannah did with Samuel, your child to the Lord, That whatever he wants with your child. If he wants to take the child early and it dies as a baby, that's his choice. If he wants to, if he wants to give them, not give them, but if he wants them to die of cancer at some point, that's his choice. All that you're doing is publicly declaring what God already knows. It's his child, not yours. <laughs> mm -hmm. See what I mean? It, it was like that the whole way you're just publicly declaring it. Um, but uh, as far as a baby baptism, we really don't have much biblical warrant for that. I haven't seen it in the Bible, so... Yeah, we don't have a biblical basis for that. I don't know where they got this um, It's basically, well, like I said, it, it, it's an idea where they're like, okay, well... Yeah, but see, like, uh, like Orthodox Catholics, Whatever they have their own Bible. I don't know what kind of Bible they have, but maybe it's written in their Bible. Well, no, not really. It's it's more of uh, of the tradition of the of the different popes and that kind of stuff because they had this question: What happens when our child dies before they're able to accept Jesus? Well, so we have to baptize them in hopes that they will be saved, and if they die before they they can choose for themselves, well, then they'll be in heaven. See what I mean? So they answered that question differently, so that way they could they could have peace at their child's death. Because yeah. remember, before the modern era, it wasn't that uncommon to have a lot of your children die. Yeah. It was actually very common. In fact, in a lot of places besides in America, it is still common for a lot of your children to die. Um, 
So, uh, that's baptism. Any questions on that? Um, one time, uh, when I was working at the call center, there was this uh, girl there, and, you know, she's a, you know, a jack, um, Catholic, you know, go on Easter and Sunday and Christmas, you know. I got you. And um, she was one, uh, she decided that, you know, she should get her kids baptized because, you know, they're like 14, 16. And um, she said that they had to go through this class and mm -hmm. oh, yeah. like do like climb up the mountain with the cross and everything mm -hmm. before they can be baptized. Yeah. They had to climb up a mountain? Yeah, the, the yeah, cross mountain. mountain over there. They make them do that here. Okay. Part of their catechism. Okay, whatever. That's something. So that's yeah. the thing you have to think. Catechism. Catechism before you have to be able to be baptized? You're telling a story before on this one. I've never here, heard somebody having I to think, climb a mountain. <laughs> uh, well, I think that's just something they do here. Well, let's hope so. The people from Ital from Italy coming all the way over here. <laughs> but, like, you have to, I guess, before you're, like, truly accepted into the church, you know, you have to take catechism and stuff. So. Confirmation. Confirmation. Oh, to become a member? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and Do you have to be baptized before you can become a member as well? Or no? I don't know about that. Uh, I don't remember. But I, that, I believe that that differs in, in, in according to the different areas. However, uh, I will mention this, that um, Catholic, in Catholic traditions, uh, you cannot, like, use the building for things. You can't be baptized oh, okay, or any of that kind of stuff if you're not. Catholic. Yeah, because Catholics do definitely have the idea of we are the church. Yeah. The Protestants are not the church. Right. Eastern Orthodox are not the church. We are the church. And a lot of Protestant churches do have this as well. And a lot of, as far as I know, the entire Eastern Orthodox has that as well. <laughs> so do they believe that different denominations are going to heaven? Yes, that's exactly what they believe. They are not going to heaven. <laughs> you have to be under the Pope's authority to go to heaven. Are there churches? My cousin married a Catholic and... Uh, excommunicated her because he was Protestant. Mm -hmm. And for a good while, her family would not have anything to do with her. Wow. So, um, my views about the questions I asked, are traditions bad? No. Traditions are really powerful tools. They are powerful tools. The problem is, if we elevate the tradition, like you guys are already saying, elevate the tradition over the person. Right. Like the right. Pharisees did with the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Was the Sabbath bad? No, the Sabbath was great. In fact, it was foundational for the law itself. <coughs> However, the person was still over the Sabbath. Right. They just abused. Right. Well, yeah, and also, you know, the Pharisees really didn't have a love for people. No. They had a love for getting respect. They had a love for being the center of attention. They had a love for having all the answers. But they didn't really have a love for God's kingdom and God's purposes. Um, but are traditions in themselves bad? No. We, we do communion, right? That's that's a, that's tradition. Uh, the Old Testament feast, where, where God said, now go and have this feast to commemorate what has happened here. The Passover, for instance. So you can tell your children what has happened here in Egypt. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Um, you know, so there's different things like that. Uh, the, the traditions really aren't inherently bad. They can be bad. They can be turned bad. They can be used for bad. That kind of stuff. But the, the idea of a tradition is not bad in and of itself. If we were a church with no traditions, imagine that. We we wouldn't worship God. We wouldn't have times of prayer. Who knows if we wouldn't have times of sermons. We might just gather together and be like, Hi hey guys. Right. I mean like traditions aren't aren't bad. They're 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 just can oftentimes be abused. Um, do the differences matter? Do the differences of the denominations matter only if it contradicts the gospel or God's character and nature? Yeah. Like for instance um, you know the whole thing about baptism. Does it? Do I think that it matters the different views that, you, that people have with baptism? Not in the least, except for the Roman Catholic view, because I don't think that that's okay to continually declare the re-crucifixion of Jesus Christ, things like that, where it's, it contradicts the nature of the gospel and God's character itself. So if it contradicts the gospel or God's character and nature, then uh, it matters. So once again. Um, the Lord's Supper, the Catholic view of the Lord's Supper, that that matters. Um, the Jehovah's Witness view of Jesus, <laughs> that matters. 
Um, you know, stuff like that where, where it contradicts God. Um, so, uh, what things do I think aren't ignored but should be? Pastors being the do-it-alls. I think that that has been a, a staple of, of, of the American church for too long. I think that I think the pastors should stop being elevated so high by people. We are here to equip you to get so you can go do your ministry, right. not so we can go do all your ministry for you. That's just not right. healthy. That's not healthy for pastors. When people get sick, why are the pastors always expected to go visit them? You visit them. You know why? Why does it have to be all, all of it? Well, he it's his job to do that. No, I'm not even denying that. But if you read in Acts, you know the the widows were having a problem with with getting the food and everything, so they went and complained to the pastors, and they said, "We're appointing elders. Go take this nonsense to them because we have a job to do here." Right. And that's exactly right. If a pastor spends all of his time out there doing all the ministries, setting up all the ministries, tearing down all the ministries, planning all the ministries, visiting everybody, do what? They'll never be able to equip you for ministry. Yes, exactly. They'll never be able to equip you. And here's one of the foundational things the pastors were supposed to do in the New Testament. They were supposed to give the word to people. That was one of the foundational thing, things. Mm -hmm. Now, we were talking with pastor about this. Now, a pastor's role in his pastorship, usually 10% or less of his time is spent in planning for sermons. That's not how it should be. In the New Testament, that was one of their main main purposes was rightly dividing the word of truth to keep people from false doctrines, to keep people from that kind of stuff, to keep people invested in the purpose of God's kingdom. Right. So, uh, next up, dressing up for services. I think this should be completely outdone with, honestly. Yeah. Um, when we see the New Testament church, we see people who went just as they were. We don't see people wearing special clothes for special things. You know, and so now what's happened is either a pastor will wear special clothes to separate him as a special person, or everybody will to show how much better they are than the, the common rabble. But here's the, here's the thing I don't understand: dressing up was something that the priests had to do in the in in the law. You know, Exodus, Leviticus, that yeah. that, yeah. that that. Why, why should we have to still do that? The only reason why they had to dress up was because they served in the tabernacle, which was the place of the holy place. But here's the thing: if we are now the holy place of God, why, why would we have to dress up to go inside of our own hearts? That doesn't even make sense. Right. <laughs> right. It, it would be really cool if the worship team wore robes. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to mention was buildings and tithes. I f I foresee the church of tomorrow not using buildings like they do, because they're expensive. Yeah. You have churches paying millions of dollars for buildings. Just to, just to keep going. And, and I don't really see that that's going to work that that much farther in the future. No. You know, I think in the future people are going to be using churches as places. Uh, you know what I mean? They'll be gathering in places to worship. Right. Gathering people's homes or gathering, you know, in, in the country. Like in China where they don't have buildings that they can worship and they go up into the hill country and worship right. there. See what I mean? And I, I, so that's one thing that I would like to see um, change is, is people's being – adoring a building. I think that needs to change. And then tithes. I think we need to get away from the idea of a tithe because this is what we do. We say, okay, I gave my 10 percent. Now leave me alone, God. I think that needs to change. And I think the New Testament shows that that changes. You know, I, I think it shows more of God owns all of it. Do everything in your ability to enhance and, 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 and further God's kingdom. Right. That's the model of the New Testament. If read again, again and again in Acts. It doesn't say then they gave their tithes. It said and then they gave all who were able as much as they could. Read in the book of Exodus when they were giving the supplies for the tabernacle, and those whose whose heart God moved gave as they were able to, and they had so much supplies that they had to ask them to stop giving supplies because they had everything that they needed. Right. See what I mean? I think that's the New Testament model: is past tithes where the whole thing is God's. You know what I mean? We shouldn't be confined to ten percent. No. You know, and then what happens to the people who are just getting their getting their finances together and can't make ten percent yet? Should we should we make them feel bad because of it? I think we should get push them past that and say, look, the whole thing is, is God's. You need to stop wasting your money on foolish things and use your money wisely to enhance God's kingdom. But once again, um, I'm kind of alone on that one. Most of the people I talk to about that are saying, yeah, but you can still encourage that while still doing the tithe. And yeah, I guess so too. It's just the idea of the tithe has become so polluted in my mind. You know, where, where people make it a thing of, I gave my ten, I gave God's ten percent, and I get on my back. You know, it's again putting it in that more legalistic mindset. I think the reason why so many people are for still doing tithes 
it's because I think they still have that fear of if they say, hey, give what you can, not just give tithes. I think there's a fear of, you know, hey, the pastor won't get paid, or hey, we can't have the church open this week because they don't have enough money for it, you know. I think they're afraid that people won't give anything. Right, and but they're not trusting on God to provide; they're trusting on men to provide. I, I mean, I, I I agree in in part with what you're saying, but um, I think that it's important in times like that to remember what Paul wrote in in Second Corinthians about how God loves a cheerful giver and and how He was encouraging them to give not out of obligation. Right. In fact, He specifically says that not out of obligation. Right. You know, and uh, He talks about providing for people in need, and He talks about all kinds of stuff like that, and it's just. It's hard to reconcile that with the kind of legalistic tone that type has in yeah. America's church. But anyways, um, so anyways, the question of the week. Do you like to party? Because next week is a party. We have no question of the week. Uh, any questions for, this, for, the, for anything we talked about? I do have one. Sure, go ahead. Um, when Abraham killed Isaac. No. <laughs> Any serious questions? Any serious questions? <laughs>